Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome to our uh, algorithmic game theory uh, session. Uh, Keros will give the first talk. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name is Curtis. Uh, I'm talking about delegated stochastic probing, which is joint work with Shadden. And so I want to start with a motivating example for our problem. Uh, you can imagine you're a city mayor and you want to design a public transportation network, but probably you don't know how to do this exactly, so you delegate the problem to a contractor. Uh, but the contractor has their own interests involved, right? So they may like designs that put bus stops at their own headquarters, or designs that fix roads in their neighborhood, and things that generally aren't best for the city, but are best for the contractor. And so we have a mechanism design problem here. How can we incentivize the contractor to give us a solution that's good for the city and not for the contractor? Uh, this is delegated search. It's a principal agent type problem uh, where the principal is the mayor and the agent is the contractor. Uh, our work is inspired by that of Kleinberg and Kleinberg who develop a model of delegated search and show some nice approximation guarantees. Uh, now, what we notice is that a lot of delegation problems are very similar to stochastic probing, which is a non-game theoretic problem we could broadly define as consisting of a set of elements where each element has a random utility x. There's an outer constraint limiting the elements we can probe, where the probe is just to learn the value of an element. And there's an inner constraint limiting the sets of elements we can accept. Now the procedure is pretty straightforward. We start by probing a set of elements subject to the outer constraint and we learn all their values. And then we accept a subset of probed elements, this time subject to the inner constraint. And our goal, as you probably expect, is to maximize the sum of the values of the elements we accept. Now, uh, what we notice is that Kleinberg and Kleinberg, their model is essentially a delegated version of a stochastic probing problem. In particular, the problem with k identically distributed elements, there's no outer constraint, and a one uniform matroid inner constraint. And we can also consider delegating other stochastic probing problems, like this transportation problem, where we have some number of bus network designs, some other number of subway network designs, for example, we might have a constant amount of time available to us, and each design costs a certain amount of time to evaluate, right? So we have a knapsack outer constraint. And our inner constraint, we want at most one bus network and at most one subway network. So in general, we may want to delegate arbitrary stochastic probing problems. And this inspires our definition of delegated stochastic probing. So that model consists of a ground set of elements E, where each element has a known distribution over X and Y utilities, X for the principal and Y for the agent. We allow X and Y to be arbitrarily correlated or not, but we require that uh, distributions from different elements are independent. We also have an outer constraint, limiting the sets of elements that can be probed, the probing constraint, and an inner constraint, limiting the sets of elements that can be accepted as a solution. Our goal is to design a mechanism maximizing the principal's utility for the elements they accept. And just as some terms for clarification, we call an element along with its utilities that triple there an outcome. So when you probe an element, you receive an outcome. And we call a set of outcomes that the principal could accept a solution. Now, what we're going to consider is the following mechanism we call a single proposal mechanism. And it works uh, by the principal starting by committing to a family of acceptable solutions, right? And so this means that for any solution in the set, in the set R, if the agent proposes it, the principal commits to accepting it. And for any solution not in R, if the agent proposes it, the principal commits to rejecting it. In response, the agent will probe some elements and they receive a set of outcomes S then they'll propose a solution, which is a subset of the elements of the outcomes they probed. Now, if that solution is acceptable to the principal, then they'll accept it as they committed to doing, and both principal and agent get their respective utilities. But otherwise, the principal will reject the proposal, and this is the status quo, so we consider this as them both getting zero utility. Uh, as an example of this, to make it kind of concrete, 
consider this example where elements are the nodes of the graph. Our outer constraint is four uniform, so we can probe up to four elements. And our inner constraint is independent sets, so we can accept any independent set of the graph. If this problem were fully defined, we would also know the distributions of elements, but I'll ignore that for simplicity. So a reasonable strategy for the principle is to set a threshold. In this case, they'll set a threshold of 10 for acceptable sets, for acceptable solutions. In response, the agent will probe some elements. For each element they probe, they uh, determine, they learn the value for the principle and for the agent of that element. And then now we can see that solution CD in this example is the principal's favorite available solution. Solution AE is the agent's favorite available solution. But this uh, solution, while it's the agent's favorite, it's not acceptable to the principal, right? So the principal would reject it if it was proposed. And so the agent will actually propose their favorite from the acceptable solutions which in this case is AD, and it's really a middle ground between the interests of the principal and the agent. So they'll propose that, and the principal committed to accepting it. And now, what we're interested in in our work is characterizing a particular notion of approximation that we call the delegation gap. It's a, a comparison between the delegated utility of the principal, which is their utility when they delegate, uh, and their non-delegate utility, which is the utility when they search on their own under the same constraints as the agent. So this is the same as the utility when they solve the stochastic probing problem. Now, the delegation gap just measures the worst case ratio between these two, uh, in optimality, of course. And you can see, or you might be able to see that it's a stronger notion than the standard notion of approximation. Uh, as a quick overview of our results in here, we show that single proposal mechanisms, the mechanisms uh, we discuss, are just as powerful as general mechanisms. We show that our model of delegation can be reduced to a combination of profit inequalities and adaptivity gaps of a certain form. And using results in these two areas, we get some inequalities. First, we show that there are constant delegation gaps for problems with downward closed outer constraints and inner constraints that are the intersection of a constant number of matroids. So this is a really broad class of problems that we get constant gaps for. And we also get a one half delegation gap for a generalization of the problem of Kleinberg and Kleinberg. And this just generalizes their result to kind of a broader model. Finally, we briefly investigate randomized mechanisms, which are lottery mechanisms, and we show that they sometimes outperform deterministic ones, but not in general. Now to end, uh, I think our work opens up a lot more questions than it closes. So I wanna leave you with some of those questions. First of all, are these factors tight? We only know that the one half is tight for the instances I described briefly, but we don't know for any others. How does it compute the strategies uh, needed to get these delegation gaps? What if elements have a probing instead of, or in addition to the outer constraint? What if the principal can incentivize the agent by making payments for solutions that they prefer? Can they do better? And finally, what if the principal delegates to multiple agents at the same time? Uh, you might imagine that they can get agents to compete with each other, and this could give the principal a better solution overall. So if you're interested in any of this, please uh, see our long form video or the paper. And that's all I have. Thank you. Very nice. If anyone has a super cool question, they can go. And otherwise, the next speaker um, can uh, share the screen. No, are you going to the next slot? Yep. Great. Uh, please go ahead. OK. Hi, I'm Noah. And I'll be talking about relaxing common belief for social networks. So the central idea that I want to start with is an idea that might be familiar to many of you, and that's the idea of common knowledge. And informally, we say a proposition is common knowledge when everyone knows that it's true, everyone knows that everyone knows that it's true, everyone knows that everyone knows that everyone knows that it's true, and so on. 
So we have these levels and at each level we add and everyone knows to the beginning uh, or to the previous level and we have an infinite number of levels and that's an informal definition of common knowledge. And common knowledge is important in game theory because it undergirds strategic coordination. So typically uh, when we want when we're interested in seeing how agents coordinate with one another, we, we will assume that they have common knowledge of some proposition and that supports their ability to coordinate. So for example, in the standard game theoretic setting, we'll assume that agents have common knowledge of the payoffs of the game and of the rationality of the other agents and that undergirds their ability to coordinate on, for example, a Nash equilibrium. Now common knowledge is, is known and thought to be a pretty strict requirement. So it's sometimes people are uncomfortable making that assumption that agents have common knowledge really of anything at all. Uh, and various ideas to on how to relax common knowledge have been explored. Uh, and an important one is the idea of common belief, which was explored in a paper by Maunder and Samet in 1989 that's really central to our work. Uh, and they propose that something should be common belief when everyone believes with probability p that it's true, everyone believes with probability p, that everyone believes with probability p that it's true, and so on. So basically what they've done is they've relaxed the definition of common knowledge by taking the word knows at every place it appears in the definition I just gave and replacing it with the phrase believes with probability p. And although I said uh, that common belief is not the only uh, relaxation of common knowledge that's been explored, uh, in some sense, it really is the right relaxation of common knowledge, because when common knowledge is approximated by common belief, we see that agents are able to approximately coordinate in the way that they would coordinate uh, if they had common knowledge of the thing that they have common belief in. Uh, and this isn't true for many of the other proposed relaxations of common knowledge. So, for example, uh, common belief in payoffs and mutual rationality allows for approximate coordination on the Nash equilibrium. So we'd like to take these ideas, uh, these recursive reasoning ideas like common knowledge and common belief and apply them in social networks uh, where we think they're important, for example, uh, for the formation and changing of social norms, which involves this type of recursive reasoning where you have to think about what other people think about you. And the problem is that the, the key notions aren't useful in many natural graphs, especially graphs that we'd wanna use as social network models. So for example, uh, on sparse graphs, population level phenomena like common belief will not arise or are very unlikely to arise. Um, and so a, a first pass at this might say, well, what if we, we relax the idea that it's a population level phenomena? And that sort of was explored by Michael Che in 1999 and 2000, uh, where he looked at a network revolt game setting uh, that required local common knowledge for coordination. So agents were uh, forming common knowledge with their neighbors in the graph but it turned out that finding pockets of this local common knowledge reduced to finding cliques. Uh, and even in dense graphs, large cliques will not be present or in many dense graphs, like a, an erdos renyi random graph with P equals one half being the probability for each edge appearing. Uh, large cliques will not be present even though agents have a lot of information. So they won't be able to coordinate in large groups in this model, even though you might expect that they should be able to. So the idea in our paper is that we want to sort of synthesize these two uh, areas of research and in a way that transcends their limitation. And the key notion here is we call factional belief. Uh, and we say factional belief relaxes common belief uh, in the same way or a similar way to the way common belief relaxes common knowledge, where we've taken the definition of common belief. Uh, and every time it said everyone, we've replaced that with there is a faction of agents. And you can see that written out on the slide here. And the idea that we explore is that factional belief undergirds partial approximate coordination uh, in a similar way that common belief undergirds approximate coordination and ultimately that common knowledge undergirds strategic coordination. And in particular, we explore that connection in the setting of network revolt games that are really inspired by that work of Ched that I mentioned earlier. So the network revolt game model that we explore we have, uh, I'll introduce the model briefly. Uh, we'll have a graph G that represents a social network that's common knowledge among the agents. And each agent will have a type that falls into one of three buckets, alpha, nu, or chi. And we'll see why these names are named the way they are on the next slide. Uh, but the idea is that types are assigned according to some state of the world, which describes the probability distribution over the types. Uh, and the game, proceeds in such a way where the agents will commit to a peer strategy 
that maps an object called their context to an action revolt or yield, sort of participating in the revolt or staying home. Uh, and the context, which is the key, act, uh, key item in our paper, is the, the information that the agents have, which is their type and the types of all their neighbors. And intuitively, we've set up the game inspired by the work of Che, uh, so that there's a natural strategy for each agent based on their type, and these strategies give the types their names, which is that agents of type alpha should always revolt, agents of type nu should never revolt, and agents of type chi should conditionally revolt, depending on their beliefs about how other agents will act. So the agents of type chi are the ones that have to engage in this recursive reasoning. Uh, and in particular, we have the agents of type chi have two thresholds, a belief threshold and a participation threshold, where they would want to revolt if they sufficiently believe that participation in the revolt will be sufficiently high, and they would prefer not to revolt if either of those two conditions is not met. Uh, so given those strategies, the, the game proceeds as follows, which is first agents commit to a strategy, then nature determines the state and agents are assigned types independently at random according to the distribution that's described by the state. Then agents observe their context and apply their strategy to, to choose an action. And we're interested in the equilibria of these games. In particular, we're interested in finding the largest equilibrium, uh, the largest revolt that's supported in any equilibrium. And it turns out that these revolts are supported by symmetric equilibria in which the agents adopt the same strategy, which are pretty much the strategies that I've described uh, previously. And that's why those strategies turn out to be so important. So uh, in this model, what we're able to do first independently of the model, we define a notion of factional belief. So I've given an informal definition, but in order to, to do anything rigorous about it, we need to formally define what it means for a group of agents to be a faction. Uh, which we do in the paper, and we show that this definition can be used to analyze revolt games on general graphs uh, by exploring those network revolt games that I just described and providing an al algorithm that characterizes, uh, in almost all cases, uh, what the largest revolt supported in any equilibrium will be and the probability with which that revolt will occur. And we show that surprisingly, it is sufficient for our algorithm to only have access to the degree sequence of the network and not the actual network structure itself. Although that result is pretty sensitive to our assumption that the types are distributed independently at random. And lastly, uh, we use some simulated network data to explore how the equilibrium revolt sizes vary as we vary underlying parameters of networks in the model. So I had to skip over a lot of the details in this short talk, but I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to uh, look at our longer video where we are able to get in more to it, or you can find our full version of the paper uh, with this archive identifier here, or feel free to follow up with Grant or I uh, after the session. Thanks. Very nice. Um, can the next speaker, uh, Kimberly, can you set up, please? Okay, before we go for the uh, third talk, let's just uh, take a 30 seconds uh, break and take a deep breath. Okay, we're ready now. Uh, All right, can, I'm ready. You, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so uh, here's my talk and this was joint work with Matt Weinberg. So um, let's suppose that we're in the last round of a chess tournament and there are exactly three players with a perfect score and we'll call them A, B, and Kimberly. Um, so A and B are playing each other in this last round and they're going to draw their game. And they know that Kimberly is going to win. Um, so if everything proceeds as normal, she'll get first place and they'll tie for second place. But if A resigns on purpose, then maybe B has a chance of tying for first place or getting first place after tie break. Um, so if A does this, then it's not very honest but it does increase their um, chances of first as a group. So this is an example of collusion. Um, and we want to know if we can design a tournament rule that minimizes the effects of collusion or upper bounds it. But what is a tournament rule? Um, okay, so when we formally define tournaments, we consider round robin tournaments with only wins and losses. So a tournament can be represented by a complete directed graph with um, an edge from A to B if A beats B. And then the tournament rule takes in this graph and outputs a winner, usually like uses some sort of probability distribution over the players um, to maybe break a tie. But um, if a rule is kind of say consistent, then if there exists a player who beats every other player, 
then that role always declares that player to be the tournament winner. Um, so in this diagram, A is the Condorcet winner, uh, they beat everyone else. So the Condorcet consistent rule would declare A the winner. Um, but in this tournament, it's not as obvious who the winner should be. Okay, um, so then what is tournament manipulation? Um, all right, so let's say there's a group of two players who wants to cheat in the tournament, but they can only control the outcome of the match that they play against each other. So we call the tournament too strongly non-manipulable um, if a change in the outcome of this match doesn't increase their collective chances of winning at all. So as it turns out, you can't have a rule that's both kind of say consistent and strongly non-manipulable. Um, or s &M. So since we can only keep one, we want to keep kind of say consistent since it seems more important. So we define a rule as two s &M alpha if two players can't increase their chances of winning collectively by more than alpha. And then previous work shows that one third is a lower bound than alpha um, and that there exist rules that are two s &M one third. Um, so here's a quick example. So we have this three player tournament where everyone beats each other in this circle like this. Um, so we're not sure who should win, but we do know that any rule has to assign someone a win probability of at least one third. Um, so let's say C wins with probability at least one third. Um, but then let's say that A loses to B on purpose and then B suddenly wins with probability one. Um, we've, let's assume that the rules kind of stay consistent. Um, so now because B beats both people, um, B definitely wins. So A and B have increased their collective chances of winning by at least one third. So this is unavoidable. However, um, what if the outcome of each match is uniformly at random and then A and B don't know who's won what match um, when they have to figure out what they're going to do to collude. So now they don't really know what to do. And the scenario is a little more complicated. So. Most previous work on tournament rules um, assumes that the colluding players know the outcome of every match, but this is actually worst case scenario um, because often in real life they don't. Um, so we're going to look at tournaments where no one knows the outcome of any match before they have to collude. They just have some general idea of what the players might do. So we consider independent probabilistic tournaments where the outcome of each match occurs with a probability drawn from the range one half minus epsilon to one half plus epsilon. Um, so we want to know if there's a lower bound for alpha here too, and if we can construct rules that meet this lower bound. And in fact, our main result consists of a bound and two rules that meet this bound, which is epsilon um, over three plus two epsilon squared over three. Um, so in the paper, we develop a useful framework to analyze recursive tournament rules. And we use this framework to analyze two rules, um, randomized desk match and randomized single elimination bracket. RCB has already been shown to be 2 SNM 3 when applied to a deterministic tournament in previous work. So both rules are structured like this. They take a group of players and then every round they select a bunch of matches for the players and then the players play and then they eliminate the losers. So first let's talk about the proof framework. Um, so if we call the colluding players U and V, then we notice that at the start of the tournament, there's usually a non-zero chance that U and V are able to collude and gain probability. And then every round something happens, maybe they both stay in the tournament and they can still collude in the future. So we call this a recursive event, um, or maybe they play each other. So we call this a terminal event because they can't um, collude after they've played each other since one of them will be eliminated, but they can collude during the match. So it's a bad terminal event. Um, if one of them is eliminated by someone else, then we call that a good terminal event um, because they didn't collude. And then another type of good terminal event um, occurs if they become identically distributed. Uh, so the gist of this is that basically um, once they beat all remaining players with identical probabilities, then it doesn't matter who wins the match between U and V because the probability of the winner winning the overall tournament is the same either way. Um, so we would like to bound the maximum probability gain that U and V can achieve via collusion. And using these definitions, um, we've created uh, this expression V times C over V plus G that actually serves as an upper bound given that you're able to find C, V, and G um, as they're defined. So a brief example here, skip over one of the proofs, but um, we analyze RCB in the, the term, sorry, in the deterministic setting using this proof framework. Um, so RCB works basically like this. If the number of original players in the tournament is not a power of two, then it pads the tournament with dummy players who always lose. Um, so playing one is equivalent to taking a bye basically um, until the number of players is a power of two. And then it's clear for this rule that C is an upper bound. I mean, C equals one is a valid upper bound because you can gain like probability of one at most maybe. Um, and then a bad terminal event occurs when U and V play so that's one over n prime minus one, where n prime is the number of players after padding. And then uh, for g, uh, it is two over n prime minus one, and 
the description is a little complicated. Um, you can read about it in the paper. It's also on this slide, but yeah, ultimately what you get after plugging it all in is one third. And since that does match the value um, obtained in previous work, which also used a separate proof method, that um, is a pretty good sign for us. So in the general case uh, where we don't make any assumptions about epsilon, um, we want to find a better bound for C since one is very generous. So we notice that if U and V play a match, then whoever wins has to beat a certain set of players in order to win the tournament. And this is independent of who wins the match. So it's the same set, which we call the gauntlet, which means that the difference in their win probabilities is at most two epsilon because of this expression over here. Um, and then the gains from the bad terminal event is two epsilon. Uh, it's maxed out at two epsilon times one half plus epsilon because um, of the probability that the original uncolluded tournament is identical to the tournament under collusion. Um, and then the general case finding B and G are pretty similar, um, full details are in the paper. Um, and we do end up arriving at this value of epsilon over three plus two epsilon squared over three um, after we plug everything into the expression that we got. And then there is um, a proof of the tightness of this bound using a similar triangle tournament as the one we saw before, this time with probabilistic edges, basically. Um, there's not actually time to get into the details here, but the general idea is we assign win probabilities to each of the cycles, and then the Condorcet winners, um, when there's a Condorcet winner, we know who wins already. So then when you take the average of the expected probability gained from um, the players, from all three groups of possible colluding pairs, um, then we end up getting an average value of epsilon over three plus two epsilon squared over three, um, which matches our value from before. And because this is an average value, there must exist one um, group of colluding players that can achieve this value when, co uh, when colluding. So in conclusion, we found a tight bound on probability gain via manipulation for Condorcet consistent tournament rules um, when applied to independent probabilistic tournaments. And we've also developed a useful recursive framework to help analyze recursive rules. And then future work might use this framework for other tournaments um, or find ways to analyze non-independent tournaments or previously studied rules that didn't work as well with our framework. Uh, yeah, so I, yeah, I guess that's it. And I'll take questions later. Fantastic, I don't need to do anything. Uh, Juba, go ahead, please. Yeah, can you hear me fine? Cool, perfect, thanks. Um, okay, so hi everyone, my name is Juba and I'm a postdoc at UPenn right now. Uh, today I'm going to tell you about my work on pipeline interventions, and this is joint work with Eshwar, Arunesh, Aiswaran, Sampath Kanan, and Aaron Roth, who are also at Penn. And so today I want to tell you about fairness, and I want to tell you about fairness in pipelines. So the reason I want to do so is because in real life, decisions by and decisions about individuals are uh, not going to be made in isolation. Rather, these decisions are going to be made throughout the life of an individual and decisions at different stages of someone's life are going to have an effect on each other and they're going to compose with each other. Um, if I look, for example, at the education in the job market pipeline, we can see how each decision is going to fit into the next which preschool I'm going to is going to affect which schools I have access to, which is going to affect what college I'm getting into, which is going to affect what kind of jobs I can get. And so when you're thinking about fairness, this can lead to difficulties. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is because disparities and inequality of access to opportunities can arise at each and at several stages of such pipelines. And then those disparities are going to compose uh, the current opportunities that I have today are restricted by previous disparities that I faced, or if you want to look at the flip side of this picture, disparities that I'm facing today may have a long-term effect on the futures of future opportunities that I will get. And even worse, we know that those disparities can arise even at the very early stages of such a pipeline. If I look at the education pipeline, we know that those disparities can arise even at the preschool level. So the question here that I want to ask is where are we going to intervene to eliminate or at least reduce those disparities? One proposition is to, in the education pipelines, to intervene at the college admission level. But however, that's often going to be too late. If disparities start at the preschool level, then it seems that interventions earlier in the pipeline are going to be needed. 
at the same time, if I only intervene very early in the pipeline, it might be hard to control the downstream and the long-term effects of such an intervention. And so what we propose in this paper is that it actually may be valuable to intervene at several levels rather than myopically and at a single level of such a pipeline. Now, if you want to do so, you need to understand how interventions at different stages are going to compose. And you need to understand how this is going to inform the optimal design of interventions at several levels of such a pipeline if your goal is to improve outcomes and to reduce disparities across groups. So in this paper, our first main contribution is to provide a theoretical and stylized model to think about such pipelines. And our model is going to be a graphical model, which is comprised of several layers. So we have agents that are going to begin in the starting layer. And the starting layer is going to be comprised of several nodes. And you can think of each node, you can think of different starting nodes as different starting groups or subpopulations or socioeconomic statuses in your problem. Then the agents are going to evolve throughout the graph and they're going to evolve through the subsequent layers. And you can think of each subsequent layer as a stage of life in this problem and each node of the, as the outcome of a given stage of life, for example. So a stage of one layer could correspond to your education level, to your college education, and the outcome could correspond to different levels of education or different majors or those kinds of issues. And finally, the agents are going to end up in the final layer. Each node on this final layer is going to have a reward, and the reward is going to be a scalar measure of the quality of the outcome that corresponds to that node. So I've told you about what a graph looks like. I haven't told you exactly how agents are going to move uh, through the graph and between two layers. And so the way individuals are going to progress through the graph is through stochastic transitions between layers. And those stochastic transitions are going to govern the probability that you're going from a node on the current layer to a node on the next layer. And that's where we're going to model disparities between populations, uh, because basically you can give different groups, different probabilistic path to different reward nodes throughout the graph. So you could imagine that some advantage populations from the beginning are going to have high probability path to high reward nodes, versus it could be that some other populations that are more disadvantaged are going to have higher probability path to lower reward nodes. And then our intervention model in this pipeline is going to be the following. We'll take the point of view of a centralized designer who can intervene at any and at several stages of such a pipeline. And an intervention is going to consist into changing the stochastic transitions between any two layers. Obviously, you don't get to do this for free. You're going to incur a cost to change transitions between any two successive layers. And our centralized designer is going to have a maximum budget that can be invested across changing all transitions between all uh, two subsequent layers. And then in this paper, our second main contribution is going to be algorithmic. And we provide dynamic programming algorithms for finding approximately optimal interventions in this problem. What I mean by optimality here is with respect to two different objectives. The first one is that we're trying to maximize the social welfare and the expected reward of the population given that there's going to be a starting distribution of our starting nodes. So this distribution is going to govern the probability that a given agent starts in any given node or any given subpopulation at the beginning of your graph. And this objective is really the best that you can achieve at the level of the whole population, but it does not really tell you anything about how the welfare is going to be split between different subpopulations. And so it may actually just ignore minority or disadvantaged subpopulations which is why we also look at a maximum objective. And this maximum objective is going to maximize the welfare of the worst off group. So if you think about the maximum objective for a second, it really tells you that the maximum objective is going to be the highest expected reward that you can achieve simultaneously for all the subpopulations. And if you were to take the welfare of the worst of population and try to improve that welfare, there would be another population that would have less welfare than the maximum objective. 
Uh, and I want to conclude this talk basically um, saying that we're not solving all the questions here. Uh, rather, this is just trying to give a first step and a first model to show that we can think about those kind of issues and interventions in pipeline in a theoretical, in an algorithmic, and in a formal manner. And there are a lot of interesting future directions, and I hope that our work is going to inspire a lot of interesting and important research on fairness and pipelines. Some of those directions are the following. Uh, first of all, you can imagine that agents from different subpopulations may face different transitions, even if they end up in the same node in the graph. So you can imagine that like uh, men and women may not have the same uh, opportunities, even if they reach the same outcomes in life. Uh, you can also imagine that transitions may not be stochastic, but they're going to involve strategic elements, because in practice, decisions don't just happen to agents and individuals, but agents are going to make choices, are going to make decisions, and are going to try to choose a path through the pipeline. It would be interesting also to build up to more complex reward models in which different people might have different utilities and might want different outcomes. And it could be very interesting to see what happens if you don't have a centralized designer, but rather you have non-centralized designers and you have different entities that can intervene at different stages, possibly independently of each other. Uh, and if you want to um, hear more technical details about this work, please refer to the full version of the talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any question. Uh, very nice. I think we're ready for our last talk. Um, I just want to remind you after the uh, last talk, we'll have a short uh, panel with some uh, with, with some poetry and also a uh, discussion and even one song. Uh, who's presenting the next talk? Is it? Sangi? Okay. Great. Thank you. Me? I can barely hear you. If you can speak a little louder, I think it would is benefit it everyone. Uh, is it better now? Can you? Oh, hear better. Okay. So, hi, I'm Fang Yi. Uh, I'm going to share with you one of my work in information illustration, and this is a joint work with Grant. So. Uh, I would like to use these eight minutes to tell you some interesting techniques that we use from information theory, which might be interesting in general TCS audience. And if you are more interested in information illustration, feel free to refer uh, to see the full for length talk. So, so the problem that we're trying to understand is how can we collect information from agents? And one main challenge is that Oftentimes, it's very difficult for us to verify whether they, they are telling us the truth or not. Their information can be subjected or, or private. So one main idea is in this uh, area is called peer prediction. So the observation is that agent signals are correlated. So suppose other people is telling the truth, then we can use their information to verify whether another agent is telling the truth or not. So in this case, we are considered two agents, Alice and Bob, that we want to collect their daily commit times. So the question that we are interested in is, we're trying to come up with a mechanism which pays agents some amount of money based on their reports, such that if they tell us the truth, they are going to get the maximum amount of money. So to put it, in, uh, to put it a little more formal, we're trying to ensure the truth tellers the truth telling is a Bayesian Nash equilibrium, and we also have the highest payment. So you cannot, uh, agents cannot co uh, corrupt such that they get more payments. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you uh, one very powerful framework called mutual formation framework, and how can we use mutual formations to design peer prediction mechanisms. And then I'm going to tell you about our main observation to introduce variational statistics to mechanism design. So uh, the model that we consider is called multi-test setting. And there's two very important assumptions that is commonly made in previous work. The first one is 
a prior similar task. That is, we consider, suppose we're trying to collect the daily commute times. We consider for each date, the commute times for alias and Bob are drawn for a common distribution PXY. And this distribution, this sample is IID distributed. And the second assumption is consistent strategy or uniform strategy. That is, added strategy on each day's report only depends on that day's signal. And this strategy is uniform across all tasks. So with these two uh, uh, assumptions in the models, one big observation is that uh, you can think their strategy as a noisy channel. Uh, so that is, that is strategy is a noisy channel. Then if you are familiar with uh, information theory, this channel is just adding noise to your, your original random variables. That is, if X and Y is Bob's and Alice signal, if Alice applies some strategy on her report on her signal and make a report, then Y, X, and X has form a Markov chains. So that is uh, the signal. So this will ensure that you have these spatial structures. With these observations, uh, you can use data processing qualities between their uh, reports. So in particular, if you can measure the mutual formation between their reports, the data processing quality tells you that the mutual formation between their signals is always greater than the mutual formation between their reports. So in this case, uh, they can only maximize their payments when telling us the truth. And in general, this data processing quality can be held for general five mutual formations. So instead of using uh, a convex function that is uh, phi a equal to a dot a, we can use arbitrary convex function phi and the uh, phi mutual formation is defined as follows. So with these observations, uh, the mutual formation framework tells you that if you can pay the mutual formations between agents' reports, then we got a pretty good mechanism. In particular, truth telling is uh, based on equivalence, and it will pay the highest amount to each agent. So, are we done here? The issue that so the remaining issue is how can we estimate their mutual formations? Uh, we use a very uh, the, the observation that we have is not new, but I think it's very interesting and powerful that may be interesting to other people as well. So we're trying to convert the estimation problem to an optimization problem. The first observation is that we can evaluate a convex function by an optimization problem with respect to its convex conjugate. So if we plug in these formulations to the fine mutual formations, we can convert the evaluation problems to a optimization problem over a convex a set of functions k, which mapping a pair of reports to a real value. So we will call these uh, scoring functions, and this value will be maximized when your k star have this form, and we will call these uh, an ideal scoring functions. So these formulations enable us to translate the problem into an optimization problem. And in the computer science uh, viewpoints, you can think k as a distinguisher between two distributions, the joint distributions and the product of marginal distributions. So in this case, if your space, report space is very simple, you can just evaluate these optimization problems directly. If your joint distribution is simple from some joint, uh, some parametric model, for example, Gaussian distribution, then we have some spatial structure for, for these k functions. So here is an example. If Alice and Bob signal are joined for a joint Gaussian distribution, if we're trying to measure the channel mutual formations, then the resulting scoring, ideal scoring function will be uh, the quadratic function. So this can reduce the, our, uh, we can consider a smaller space of possible scoring functions. And finally, you can consider latent variable model that, uh, that trying to approximate this, uh, trying to approximate these scoring functions. 
And on the other hand, you can it, this ideal scoring function have uh, is also highly correlated with some uh, known properties in the machine learning literature. So first of all, the ideal scoring functions depend on the ratio of the conditional distribution and the prior distributions. So uh, this quantity is well known as the observed to expected ratio. And finally, it would be sufficient for us to estimate the soft classifier, which is the probability of y condition on x. And this value is basically we try to aggregate all the agents we call to predict one agent signal. And so this can be easily extended to uh, uh, arbitrary number of agents as well. So I think that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Uh, very nice. Let's, let's thank all, all the speakers again. And and we have we have so we have a, a panel um, discussion now. I, I thought that one way uh, while while you're all thinking about the questions they want to discuss on the panel, I thought uh, it would be nice to start the panel. Uh, ask uh, each of the speakers to uh, write a short uh, poem about their uh, work, so you can remind yourself about the the paper, and then um, and 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 then and then we'll we'll, we'll discuss some questions that you come up with. So while while you're all thinking about questions. Um, uh, uh, the first paper, uh, Curtis, did you write a poem? Yeah, uh, Shadon wrote me. Yeah, yeah, but, okay, Shadon. So, 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 please, one of you share share a screen and, and share the poem. Yeah, let me do that. Uh, yeah, so here, can you see that? Yep, yep. Too lazy to probe, so you delegate. Are you destined to lose? Is that your fate? Much utility you need not forfeit with adaptivity gaps and inequalities of profit. <laughs> I think that gives a very nice overview. <laughs> very nice. Uh, who's next? Uh, Noah, did, did you have a uh, one? Yeah, so I wrote a haiku for relaxing common belief for social networks, so here it is. Coordination breeds recursive reasoning. What you think, I think. Oh, well, these haikus, you sometimes really need to, to stare at them for a little bit to, to really get the... Okay, uh, Kimberly? Uh, yeah, so I didn't know we were gonna have to read them out loud, otherwise I would have written a shorter one. Oh. <laughs> um, Maybe you guys can just look at it. Matt, do you want to do you want to read it? Sure, I can try a uh, dramatic reading. If uh, Kimberly, you don't want to read it yourself, I don't think I want to read. This is like twenty lines. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, yeah, do you want me to or too long? Yeah, right. please, 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 please. I haven't seen this before, so apologies. Uh, said you, I know it's cheating, but I think we should collude. Said V, I agree, even though it's kind of rude and unfair. Still, who cares? But it is indeed a shame that we don't know the outcome of any single game. Said you, we do know that games are closely fought, so a win guaranteed might help us out a lot. Said V, so we're all equal, no one's really strong. Said you, basically by plus or minus epsilon. <laughs> Said V, well, that sucks. That's not good news to me, given the rule they're using, <laughs> which is RSEB. <laughs> the most that we will get out of working collectively is epsilon plus two epsilon squared all over three, <laughs> which really isn't worth the loss <laughs> of all my dignity. Said you, that's not much, but it's not nothing at all. Said V, recall that epsilon is surely very small. Said you, what a shame. Life is really very cruel. If only they had gone and used a different sort of rule. Thank you, Kimberly, for writing that. That, that was fantastic. We're, uh, um, Kimberly, if you can unshare for now. We're actually going to do a little switch in the order. I'll, I'll, let, uh, I'll, I'll keep Juba for last. And um, uh, Fangi, did you write a poem? 
you don't prepare for that. Oh, it's okay. Um, okay, so 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 uh, I'll let uh, Juba take it. Uh, um, all right, disclaimer, as Yad said, that you could either write a haiku or go for any other form of art. So I did the most ridiculous thing I've done in a long time. Uh, <laughs> also, I'm going to need to share sound. How do I do that? Yes. <laughs> Don't judge me too much. My study cross today to see if I can help. Learning can be unfair. A girl does can hate. Decisions are composed from your birth to your grave. And I want to intervene to make my clients more fair. Can you solve this graph? My sweet CS. Everything I know is unfair. Then the end. But we could do better. All those big decisions. I won't let you know. I will make things fair. All right. <laughs> That, that that was uh, uh, truly fantastic. That was a uh, great artistic uh, um, part of the panel. Um, I, right. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I have a couple of, of questions that uh, people have already sent for the um, uh, panel system, but, but if, if you think of some, uh, please uh, continue to send them. Um, so, so the the first question, uh, and and any anyone on the on the panel is. Uh, Speakers, co-authors, uh, anyone else, feel free to jump after it. So the first question had to do with um, relating these really cool results that we saw to um, uh, practice. What, what are some things that might apply? What are some barriers, uh, uh, changes in the model you would do? I can take a stab at that. I think. Um... For our model, one of the biggest barriers to really applying it is probably just a lack of information because uh, the principal would have to be aware of all of the possible elements that can be probed and have very good information about their distributions. So having results that don't need such exact information uh, could be really useful to applying this. Anyone else have thoughts? Yeah, so I think in our, in our setting, we consider multi-test setting, which assumes that the signal or IID draw the test. And this assumption I think is too strong. And in particular, agents may try to learn the dynamics and improve their strategy as time goes by. So consistent strategy is not making too much sense, I think, in the practice. Yeah, so for our paper, we thought about tournaments where they're um, round robin and there's a number of matches that you don't know the results of yet. Um, whereas in real life, usually um, I feel like you often know the results of some of the matches and not some others. So maybe more true to life model would reflect that. Kimberly, if you only knew your own results, 
Would, would, any, would anything hold? If I only knew my own results. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, in our work, we don't rely on knowing any results. Um, so, yeah, I am not really sure about that. Knowing your only your own results and only that would still be a kind of weird thing, right? Like what you would really want is for the algorithm to also design the order in which games are played, and then you only know what came before, if possible even adaptively. In 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 a, in a sports setting, you, you you it's more of a show, right? So so you want everyone to see the results, but uh, you can think you can think of some setting where you care more about the. Um, this preventing strategizing than um, than the show. That's fair. And, and and then you could hide the result. Um, maybe 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 you can still broadcast the results. And if if it's like uh something that all the games are happening in one day, you can bad still broadcast the result on TV to audience, yeah, but just not to the participants. Right, they're in isolation or whatever. That's true. I think just, just to uh, quickly elaborate on what Kimberly was saying is that um, I agree with what she said that for the positive results, we're not, you know, she's not assuming any knowledge of anything. For the lower bound, you could maybe, the lower bound requires saying, oh, on this graph, you can't do better because here's a manipulation that requires them to know what happens in all the other matches. So it could be that with an assumption like that, you can do something better, but the positive results would still hold. And anyone else? Maybe, maybe someone has like a, a positive thing about how how their theory result maybe can some somehow apply to practice. Oh, I was actually just going to say that I mentioned some of the directions that I wanted to uh, actually follow into short work. So not a positive thing, rather just trying to extend those results. And of all directions that I mentioned, I think the one that's um, most important to me and the one that I really want to follow up on is where. Even if you arrive at the same node throughout the graph, if you're coming from different populations, you may face different transitions, you may face different opportunities, and I want to see how you can deal with this, because that's something that really happens in practice. So for the, the paper with Feng Yi on determining this mutual information, th this paper is, is in some ways a very practical paper. It was very hard to get um, theoretical results that there are th new theoretical results, but a lot of times um, in the, in the models, it's they don't capture the fact that you want as much information as you can about a person's signal in order to to suss out the difference between people that are slacking and people that are trying as much as possible. In equilibrium, everyone tries and everything works and it's good. In practice, you want to to learn that with as much accuracy as possible. And we, we feel that this um, way of doing it is actually uh, has real promise to do a lot better than the, than the previous results in practice. Uh, great, great. If you, you, can, you can come back to that. I, I wanna say that the other session is, is uh, uh, starting in a few seconds. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hang out here for a little bit longer, but if, if you want to uh, hear more talks, um, I, I don't promise I'll have poems, but otherwise the, the papers look very nice. Um, I, I, have, I have one more uh, contributed question for those of you uh, staying. Um, so uh, this, this was a, a, a question from uh, Fangi about uh, modeling it agents as as rational versus um, as uh, stochastic I guess if that's a, or, or some maybe maybe there is some somewhere in, in between that we should and, and you can elaborate on that thank you uh, so uh, I, I noticed that recently there's more and more paper trying to design mechanism for multi-agent system and they make some behavior or something on them. For example, the model I'm, in my mind is like inference mechanizations, like occurring contagions, right, in a certain way, and trying to come up with algorithm for that. 
and I'm wondering um how so I, I wonder how, how should we handle those assumptions and how much do we do to improve those things or we should spend more effort on verifying those assumptions or relaxing those assumptions. That was my says no. Anyone has any thoughts, insights? I, I tend to think it's probably generally a safe assumption that agents are rational, but uh, what's more uncertain is what their incentives are, what their goals are, and that may be unknown even to them. Um, but I think we can still model them as rational just with kind of a complicated set of goals or interests. I, I don't have any, any anything super clever to add. I, I think I think, we did, I think it was a, a great panel. If, if if anyone has any last minute uh, questions or or another poem, uh, feel free to share. I, I, otherwise, you, I th I think I think I'll I'll log off. But you can all uh, uh, stay on the call and hang out and uh, discuss further. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks again to the speakers and. Uh,